try to remember. Okay, so this is where we were. We were talking about group sparsity, where you want to look for solutions where certain predefined sets of variables are turned on and off as a group. And the ways that we enforce that is by, by means of these group regularizers. So you break the unknown vector into subvectors corresponding to the groups. And then you take, take the norm separately for each subvector and then uh, just add them up. Okay, and this seems to be a fairly effective way of inducing group regularity. Now, if I just squared this and sum them up, then it would just be the two norm of the whole vector squared, okay, uh, which is something completely different. So it's important that we're only taking, we're taking a true norm here, not a square norm. That's very important. Okay. Um, all right, and there are weighted versions, as I talked about, and I showed you these pictures earlier on. Um, okay, different kinds of mixed norms, and then the choice where you take the infinity norm here. Um, okay, so different scenarios. First, are the, <coughs> the ones I've been talking about up to now, which is where the groups don't overlap. That's kind of the easy case. Then there are cases where the groups are structured according to some sort of tree structure. That comes up a lot in wavelet type applications. And the third one is where you've got um, structured according to groups in a graph. Okay, so non-overlapping groups where the different the partitioning of the elements of X into a group really is a partition where there's no overlap between them, there's no intersection, and they then the union is just a set of all the indices. And then you get these kinds of norms that I talked about. Okay. Um, Tree structured groups, um, this is where the groups are designed so that there is overlap between the groups. But if there is any overlap, one is inside the other one, okay? And so you can form kind of a hierarchical structure of the groups. So for example, you could start out with these three groups, and then there could be another group which is inside the blue group. And then there could be another group that includes these two groups, okay? And so you can actually make up a tree uh, <coughs> based on the uh, different sort of groups. So you start out with these first three groups here on the bottom, and then the blue group is a super group of the first one, and the uh, purple group is, includes the bottom two. And then there could be a group that includes all, all of those indices. <coughs> okay. So the rule for here is if you decide not to use a group, that means all its descendants are also not included as well. So if I decide to set this group to zero, it means that all the elements in the green group are also zero. Okay, and if I turn this group off, the purple group, it means that these two groups also do not appear in the solution. So there is a kind of a structure in the solution. Okay. Um, all right, looks like here I want to say a little bit about matrix inference problems. So these are analogous to finding the sparsest vector, the most the vector with fewest non-zeros that satisfies a system of equations. Okay, that's mostly what we talked about in the first session. But there's an analogous problem when you're dealing with matrices. In the case where X is a matrix, an M by N matrix, you could be making linear observations of the elements of X, okay? So you could be observing a specific element of X, or you could be observing a linear combination of the elements of X. And so B now contains the observations that you make about X, and operator B contains the... Uh, description of how the observations are collected. Okay, so instead of looking for the sparsest matrix X that satisfies these observations, you might be interested in finding the lowest rank X, okay, that satisfies these observations. And um, under certain conditions on the observation operator here, you can show that the lowest rank, if you're looking for a low rank X, this process, solving this problem, will actually find it. Now, the rank operator is very much like the cardinality operator. It's a close analogy there. Okay, and the rank operator, the rank of X is just defined as a number of non-zero singular values. Okay, just like this operator is defined as a number of non-zero elements of X. So there's a close analogy between this and this. However, this is just as hard a problem as that one. Just like this in general is an NP-hard problem, so is this an NP-hard problem, minimizing the rank subject to, there should be a constraint here. It should be that this is less than or equal to some threshold. Okay. <coughs> and so this is also a hard problem. So we want to look for um, a more tractable version of this problem. 
Okay? And it turns out that the more tractable version is given us by the nuclear norm that I defined earlier today. So the nuclear norm of a vector of a matrix X is just the sum of the singular values. And there was some work on this by Ben Recht and Candace and others around 2010 that showed if you replace the rank by the nuclear norm, then given that certain um, conditions were true on the operator B, that, that solving the nuclear norm problem actually gave you the same solution as solving the rank problem. Okay. And just recalling what the definition of the nuclear norm, it's the sum of the singular values of X. Another way you can define that is the uh, trace of the square root of X transpose X. I like this definition better. Okay, it's kind of more, it's easier to say, sum of the singular values. All right. Um, you can come up with different variants of that. So this is like the one norm of the matrix in some sense, you know, of the singular values. You can come, you can replace that with a sort of a Q norm. These are called Shatton norms. So that's where you just take each sum singular value and raise it to the power Q and add them up and then take the Qth root, okay? Uh, there are other norms. If you take uh, Q equals 2, you get the Frobenius norm. And that's also a very important norm. That's just the, um, it turns out you can define that as being the sum of the squares of all the elements of X. And they take the square root of that. <coughs> and then there's the spectral norm. The spectral norm is just the maximum singular value. So they're all particular cases of the Shatton norm. And the nuclear norm is just the case where Q equals 1, of course. Okay, so if you're using the nuclear norm as the regularizer rather than the rank, you can write down the Tikhonov formulation, which is the sum of the data fitting term with some multiple of the nuclear norm. This looks a lot like what we had when the, in the case of the x being a vector, okay, where we had the one norm here and the, sum, and the square, least squares operator there. Okay. Um, when you've got, well, we're assuming that these, operated, these observations are linear, and that means that each observation in the, in the operator beta is given, it, you can define it in terms of a, a matrix BI, okay? And so you can think of the, the ith observation as being the inner product of a matrix BI with a matrix X. And the inner product of two matrices, the conventional definition of that is just the trace of B transpose X. You also get it by just taking the products of the corresponding elements of the two matrices and then just adding them all up. It's like an inner product. Okay. <clears throat> and in the particular case of matrix completion, that's the case where each uh, matrix has, a, has one, one, and is everywhere else zero. So matrix completion is the case where I'm observing a single element of X. Okay. Each observation is the observation of a single element of X. So that's the particular case where BI Almost all the entries in BI are zero, except for one of them, which is a one. Okay. <coughs> so why does the nuclear norm favor low rank solutions? Well, remember we had this uh, soft thresholding operator when we were dealing with um, the one norm and the zero norm. I reduced it down to a single variable and showed you what happened when you took um, the minimizer of y minus x squared plus uh, the one norm or lambda times the one norm of y or of x. And we were able to write down explicitly what that was. Well, it turns out in this case, if you do the same thing here, if you look at the solution of this problem, where this is the nuclear norm operator, <coughs> then it turns out that if you know what the SVD of y is, if you know that it's u times sigma times v transpose, just reminding you what this, the singular value decomposition it's a product of three matrices, where this one is um, uh, this one is an orthogonal matrix. Um, let's see, which is the bigger number here? Well, okay, these are both matrices with orthonormal columns. U and V are both matrices where the columns are orthonormal vectors. Okay, they're all orthogonal to each other. Okay, and sigma in the middle is the diagonal matrix of singular values. All right, so the solution of this problem, where you're trying to find the matrix X that's closest in Frobenius norm to Y, but also satisfies this additional objective. I'm sorry, this here should be an X, not a gamma. Okay, that should be an X in there. Okay. Um, the solution to that problem, you can write it down in closed form. 
And actually, this here should be a gamma, I think. This should be a gamma, okay? So I think you need to switch. We need to switch these two. Uh, where's that? I'm thinking this should be a gamma. And that should be an X here. Okay. Because it turns out you can write down the closed form solution of this problem. X is the closed solution of this minimization over X. It's just the matrix you get by taking the same orthogonal vectors U and V. But you replace the, vec you replace the matrix in the middle by the soft thresholded version of the matrix. Okay, so you take each of these singular values and you do that soft thresholding operator that you did with the L1 norm, but you apply it individually to each of these singular values. Okay, so what that means is that if the singular value is bigger than tau, you subtract tau from it. Okay, so if it's bigger than tau, you replace it by itself minus tau. If it's less than tau, you just replace it by zero. Okay. So the, the takeaway here is that, and this is basically what you do in the one norm case. So this is more evidence that the nuclear norm applied to matrices acts a lot like the one norm applied to uh, vectors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of y. So y is the matrix that we're given, and x is going to be the version of y after we've done this regularization on it. Okay. So if tau were equal to zero, x would just be equal to y, and we're done. But we want to we want to come up sort of with a lower rank version of y. That's the purpose of this. So this is giving us a lower rank version. The reason that it's lower rank is that when you do this soft thresholding operator, some of these singular values get set to zero. Okay, the ones that are less than tau get set to zero. So the bigger that you make tau, in general, the lower the rank is going to be because more and more of the singular values will be set to zero. And ultimately, when tau gets bigger than the biggest singular value, then the solution will just be zero, okay? The solution will be x equals zero. I'm sorry about that typo. That should be an x, and that should be uh, lambda. Okay, so, um, okay, here's another interesting inference problem that you can do with matrices that's quite a popular one. So suppose we're given n samples of a Gaussian random variable. And they're all drawn from the same random distribution, the same normal distribution, with a given mean mu and a covariance C, covariance matrix C. Okay? So we're given these n samples. So we can form a sample covariance from this using this usual expression. And what we'd like to estimate is the inverse, of inverse covariance. Now, why do we want to know the inverse covariance? Inverse covariance gives in, in, interesting information about the components of the random variable. So in this random variable Y, if, if you've got two components that are conditionally independent, that is YI and YJ are conditionally independent given that we know all the other components of the vector, okay? That will be revealed by the fact that the IJ component of the inverse covariance will be zero, okay? So it's an interesting problem to figure out what this, um, what this inverse covariance matrix is given nothing more than a bunch of observations of the random vector, okay? So we're assuming here we don't know what C is. We're trying to figure out the inverse of C just by making a, making a bunch of, inf uh, of observations of Y, okay? So you can write down a log likelihood function for this, and it looks like this. The unknown here is P, which is the inverse covariance that we're trying to recover. S here is the, um, the sample covariance matrix. This is the log of the determinant of P. This is the trace of SP, and then there's a constant term. Now, it turns out that if you just ignore this term here and take the derivative of this with respect to P, you just get that P is equal to S inverse, okay? Which sort of makes sense, all right? Just to first, the best guess you could probably make of the inverse covariance is just to take the inverse of the sample covariance, okay? The derivative of this with respect to P is just S. The derivative of this with respect to P is P inverse. So when you set that to zero, you just get P inverse equals S, okay? Or P equals S inverse. However, um, unless we're very lucky, that's going to give us a dense matrix. It's not going to reveal these 
conditional independences that we're looking for. So we like to impose some structure on P so that it will show up, you know, of the elements of P, which are the, which are the small elements of P are noise and which ones really should be zero if we took an infinite number of observations. So how do you do that? Well, you take this objective and you add on a regularization term, which we've been doing all day today, okay? So what's the appropriate regularization term in this case? It's just what you get by just summing up all the absolute values of the elements of P and taking the one norm, okay? So just take the absolute values of all the elements of P and just sum them up. So I've got this operator vect P, which just transformed the matrix P into a vector, and then I just take the one norm of that, okay? So that's my regularizer psi of P. So I add that onto the objective, and so what's going to be the effect of this? It's going to find a matrix P that's close to being the inverse of the sample covariance, but also it's going to try to make it sparse, okay? And the bigger that I make tau, the more sparse it will make it. So this is an interesting uh, thing to do. In fact, that's all I'm going to say about this for the moment. But this, this uh, formulation is often used to recover uh, inverse covariances. It's very useful when you're observing random matrices that have a graph structure for the dependence between the Sorry, when you're observing random vectors where there's a graph structure for the dependence between the components of the vector. The non-zero elements of P will tell you where the arcs are in the graph, okay? So it's used a lot when you're trying to analyze social networks and things like that. All right, here's another thing that I hopefully will be able to say more about in the, uh, in later in this hour, um, and that's atomic norm regularization. This came up in a work from about 2010 involving Ben Recht and Venkat Chandrasekharan and Pablo Perillo, I think, and, uh, and one other, uh, Alan Wilski, I guess, from MIT. So this sort of goes to the heart of what we're doing in all of these cases and all of these kind of sparse recovery things. Basically what's going on is that we've got an unknown X and we have prior knowledge that the unknown X is a, a positive conic combination of a of a number of atoms, okay? So X lives in this ambient space. And most of what we talked about today, X has been a vector in Rn, okay? Or it's been a matrix in Rn by N. However, the X that we're really looking for belongs to, really belongs to a much smaller space. In the, in the case that we talked about earlier, it belongs to a space of sparse vectors, say with at most K non-zeros. Or it might belong to a space of low rank matrices. And so in general, you can formulate the X that we're looking for as a combination of a small number of atoms. So in the case of compressed sensing, each of these AIs might just be a unit vector in Rn. It might be a vector with just zeros everywhere except a one in one location, okay? Or in the case of matrices, it, each AI could be a matrix of rank one, okay? So that the X that we're trying to recover is a combination of a small number of um, of elements or atoms in this, in this ambient space. Okay, so that's in general what we're trying to do. So you can define a, a gauge on this space to be, let's see, you can define it to be, um, uh, okay, yeah, you can define it to be the infimum over T, over positive T, such that X is below, okay, so this, this A, by the way, is a set of atoms. It's the set of it's, it's the atomic set that spans the ambient space, kind of the building blocks for the space. So in the case of Rn, the atoms could just be each of the unit vectors. The, the atomic set would contain n elements. In the case of matrices, the set of atoms is actually infinite because there are infinitely many rank one matrices of size m by n, okay? And the x that you're looking for could be a combination of any number of them. So the, the set A could have infinite cardinality. Okay, but we can define a norm of a given x um, by, t uh, by taking um, the minimum t such that x belongs to t times the convex hull of A, A being the set of atoms. All right, so I'm going to assume that A is centrally symmetric about the origin. So in fact, if I'm dealing with Rn, the, atom, the atomic set should be all the unit atoms and their negatives. Okay, because I like, for convenience, I like to keep all the coefficients. I like to think of all these coefficients, ci, as being non-negative. 
OK, so we can define a norm like this. Um, and therefore, we can then define the atomic norm. We can show that that's equivalent to the infimum of the representation of x in terms of the atoms. OK, so I look for the, you know, there are typically infinitely many ways that I can represent x as a linear combination of atoms from the atomic set. But if I find the one for which the sum of the coefficients is minimized, that's actually equivalent to the norm. OK, so this atomic norm gives us a very natural regularizer. It's very natural to use this as a regularization function in those contexts that I talked about earlier. OK, so here's an example. In two-dimensional space, the atoms would, would just simply be the two unit vectors and their negatives. And if I've got a vector, say, minus 1 fifth and 1, then the minimal representation of this, or one of the mineral, minimal representations, is 1 fifth times this vector plus 1 times this vector. And that gives me a norm of 6 over 5, okay? which happens to correspond to the 1 norm. Okay. And so uh, there are others. You can, uh, you can show that most of the interesting um, cases that we've talked about today can be posed in this form. You can, for things like uh, rank uh, nuclear norm minimization and L1 and so on, you can write down atomic sets and you can express the L1 norm or the nuclear norm in terms of an atomic norm, defined in terms of that appropriate atomic set. Okay, and I've got some examples there. Okay, so that we can then write all of the problems that we've been talking about earlier. We can write down the uh, regularized problem in terms of the atomic norm, and we can solve that guy. So we already have shown today that by considering special cases of these atomic norms, we can come up with various formulations, and different, there are different alternatives in the formulation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about solving those special cases. But it's sort of interesting to think about, can you design algorithms that work in general with the atomic norm formulation, regardless of what context this norm is cropping up in? And it so happens that the frank wolf approach is very well suited to this general formulation, also known as conditional gradient. And if I get time, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. It turns out to be a very good uh, framework for dealing with general atomic norm uh, situations. And I have a paper with a couple of co-authors where we sort of write down what the Frank Wolf method is. It's a very general, very elementary method, and show that you can adapt it to many, many special cases of the atomic norm form. Okay. Okay. So the summary of the the first uh, part of this talk were that we've shown that many problems in inference and learning and signal image processing can be written as optimization problems that regularizers that induce some sort of sparsity play an important role in recovering solutions that are interesting. Um, <clears throat> there are different ways to induce sparsity, different ways of imposing sparsity, the Tikhonov way, the Ivanov way, and Morozov is the other one, I think. Um, it's possible to go from vectors to matrices, and atomic norms provide kind of a unified framework. Okay, well, the rest of it's just references, so. OK, so let me <coughs> switch to the second deck if I can figure out how to close this one down. This is going to be exciting. There we go. Oh, gee, handle like an expert. OK, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a Windows user, so I'm surprised that, was, that went so smoothly. OK, so now I'm going to talk about first order methods, and this overlaps quite a bit with uh, what Francis talked about. So, um, but you know, you might enjoy seeing my take, which is a little bit different. And it also, it doesn't completely overlap. There are some aspects that are not quite the same. All right, so, but fortunately, some of the notation is the same. I think he was using mu for the strong convexity parameter. So we're doing the same thing here. So at least that much is the same. All right, so I'm going to talk mostly about first order methods here and accelerated first order methods and so on. OK, but unlike Francis, I'm going to assume up front that I'm dealing with a smooth function f. So that this derivative here really is a derivative. It really does exist. And it's got a unique value. OK. So we're going to assume that the, eigen, that the eigenvalues of the Hessian of f are bounded below by mu and above by l. OK. Now, if we're dealing with convex f, 
this lower bound is, is zero at worst. Mu is zero. <coughs> but in the case where mu is positive, then we've got a strongly convex situation. And the, we know that the function f has at least some sort of positive curvature. And as Francis pointed out, you can say more about algorithms where the mu is positive. You can prove faster convergence rates, as we'll see in a moment. You can also talk about the conditioning. The conditioning is the ratio of the two extreme eigenvalues. And the closer they are together, the closer that kappa becomes to 1, and the easier the problem becomes to solve. So if L and mu are very similar, kappa is not much bigger than 1, and it turns out that first-order methods are very effective. They converge very rapidly. Okay, as we'll see. All right. So often we'll talk, again, Francis, great minds think alike. He also uh, spent a bit of time talking about convex quadratics because a lot of what you learn about first-order methods you can observe just by looking at the quadratic case. So a lot of what I say will focus on that. All right, so what's the setup here? We're talking about iterative methods. <coughs> and in the classic sort of greedy iterative method, like... Um, uh, like uh, steepest descent, for example, the, the you generate the next iterate, xk plus 1. That's your next guess at the solution. It's some function of xk. Okay? Typically, it uses xk and some information about the gradient of f at xk. There are other methods, which I'll talk about, where you use information not just from xk, but also from the previous iterate, xk minus 1. And Surprisingly, you can get significant advantages by looking at the last two iterates. There also might be methods where you look at the entire history of the iterates, all the way back to the initial iterate x0. But it turns out you don't get too much more benefit from that. You get most bang for the buck just looking at the last two, okay, for reasons that I'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so I'm going to assume that we can always evaluate the function and its gradient at any point. Now, in the case of learning, which is mostly what Francis talked about, you typically can't do this, okay, because the f consists of a sum over all the observations you've made of some loss function. And to evaluate f and grad f, you have to look at every term in that sum, which is impossible to do in a practical time. So that's why he moved on so quickly to talk about stochastic gradient. However, in compressed sensing and other image processing applications, it does make sense to evaluate these. There are reasonable algorithms where you can get these in a reasonable amount of time. And see, so the, these, these methods are not completely irrelevant to, uh, to image processing, signal processing, and so on. Okay. Now, even though I'm talking about smooth problems here, the sorts of algorithms I'm talking about do generalize to more general situations. So by making, in some case, pretty, pretty minor tweaks to these methods, you can, get, uh, you can extend them to non-smooth functions. You can extend them to the case that Francis was talking about, stochastic gradient methods where you can't evaluate f. They serve as the motivation for those methods, as you saw this morning. Um, you can, uh, again, this is stochastic gradient where you can only get an estimate of the gradient. In the case where you've got constraints, where you're trying to restrict x to a certain set, then these methods are still kind of relevant. They can be specialized to that case. And they can also be specialized to the case that we were talking about in the first session where you've got not just f but a regularized version of f. Okay. So these algorithms can be adapted to those kinds of scenarios. Okay, so here's the classic steepest descent approach, also known as gradient descent. And this is truly descent, okay? So descent is often a misused word in this context because some of these algorithms actually don't always go downhill. But this one does, provided you're careful about how you choose the alpha, the step length. And the idea is you just head in the negative gradient direction. And that's intuitive in the sense that if you think of the contours as giving you the great, you know, if you actually draw a picture of what the graph looks like um, and you put a ball at the current point xk, it's actually going to roll in this direction. If you release it from a resting position, it's actually going to roll in this direction. Okay, so there seems to be a natural direction to go in. Okay, so the trick is how do you choose, how do you choose an appropriate value of alpha k? Well, traditionally in optimization, for years and years, before optimizers collided with people that do signal processing and compressed sensing and learning, we sort of assumed that you could always evaluate f, okay, and it wasn't too expensive. 
So our approach was that we chose some initial value of alpha, let's call it alpha bar, and we tested to see when we plugged in alpha k equals alpha bar, we tested to see if this gave us a decrease in f. And if it didn't, then we just tried one half alpha instead, okay? And if that didn't work, we tried one quarter alpha and so on. So we just kept backtracking. Eventually, you're guaranteed that if you're not already at a minimizer where the gradient is zero, then this is guaranteed eventually to give you a point with a smaller function value. And you can prove that using an argument based on Taylor series, okay? Taylor series is kind of the foundational, Taylor's theorem, I'm sorry. Taylor's theorem is kind of the foundational theorem of smooth nonlinear optimization. Okay, and it will show you that for a small enough alpha, this will always give you a decrease. All right, so that's one approach. And I guarantee that in your lifetime, you're probably going to write a code that does this, you know, dozens of times because it's so easy to do this. You just have a little loop which tries this and then tests F and, and stops when you get one that works. Okay, so this is okay provided it's not too expensive to evaluate F. Another approach is that you don't try this. You just try to make some prior value of alpha k based on what you know about f. And suppose you know the bounds on the eigenvalues of the Hessian of f. You know what l and mu are. Then you can come up with a version of alpha that's guaranteed to work. Okay? And I'll show you what that is on the next slide. Or you can maybe gain some experience, and this is in practice what a lot of people do in learning. They get a very good feel for the sorts of data sets they're working with and the sorts of functions that they're working with. They get to, to learn themselves what an appropriate value of alpha is. So they can make some kind of a smart choice of alpha. Okay? And this is very obviously very user dependent, very application dependent. All right? Okay. But I'm mostly going to talk about uh, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, number three here. Number two, by the way, is kind of a smarter way of doing backtracking. You can actually make educated choices of alpha k by doing sort of an interpolation along the line defined by alpha. Okay, so you can sort of fit quadratics to the values of alpha you've tried so far. All right, I think it's time for a break. So let's take our two-minute break. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, Okay, so here's, this is the case when we're trying to find an alpha that, you know, what conditions do we, we require on alpha to, to make sure that we can prove that the method actually converges to a minimizer. So when you're looking for an alpha that's more or less, you know, doing a good job of reducing the function, you typically want two conditions to be satisfied. First of all, you want to make sure the function decreases, but it has to decrease more than just by an infinitesimal amount. You actually want it to decrease by some multiple of alpha k times the norm of the gradient squared. So this is a slightly stronger condition than just requiring that the new f be less than the old f. And there are examples that show that uh, if you don't require this, you can get stuck at a point that's not optimal. Okay, so that's the first condition. And the second one says that the gradient at the new point transpose the gradient at the current point should be bigger than or equal to this. Now what this means if you're actually finding the, the alpha that exactly minimizes f along the search direction, this will actually be zero. Okay, this, this directional derivative will actually be zero. So this is a relaxation of the directional derivative. So these are called the Wolf conditions. And these are kind of conditions that allow you to prove that this thing will converge uh, to a solution. And what you can do if you've got, if you're able to evaluate f without much trouble, you can just do a one-dimensional line search for alpha k, and you can prove that it's you know, within a fairly small number of iterations. If you're reasonably clever, you can find an alpha k that satisfies both of these conditions. Okay, backtracking, that also works. I won't talk too much about that. But here's what I mostly want to talk about, because this is kind of in line with what Francis was discussing this morning. So you can actually do a Taylor series expansion of f. Um, uh, yeah, you can do it. You can use Taylor's theorem, which basically gives you a way to approximate f of x in terms of the function value at a nearby point and its derivatives. Okay, so if I apply if I apply Taylor's theorem to using x k as the anchor point and trying to estimate f of x k, uh, f of x k plus one, I get this expression that f of x k plus one is less than or equal to this. 
So if I can choose the alpha k to make this thing here positive, and in fact to make it as big as possible, then I can guarantee that I get a certain amount of decrease in f over this step. And this is a nice quadratic function, okay? And so it's possible to choose alpha to maximize this guy. And it turns out that the maximizing choice is 1 over L. Okay, so if you set alpha to be 1 over L, this thing turns into 1 over 2L, and you're guaranteed to get this much decrease. Okay? So using this, we can actually show that the whole thing is going to converge to a minimum. In other words, a minimum is a point where the gradient is 0. But you can actually say more than that. You can show that it converges at a certain rate, okay, which is nice. So you're guaranteed not only to get convergence, but to get some handle on how fast it's converging. So let me show you. I've got two or three slides that summarize an argument. I think I saw it first in Nestrov's book in 2004, which, uh, which uh, Francis also referred to. So let's work through that argument. So if I just rearrange this formula, I get the gradient on the left-hand side and the difference of the two latest function values on the right-hand side. Okay. Now I'll just sum both sides from, from 0 up to n, where n is some iterate, okay, some random iterate. So you get telescoping of this sum, you get cancellation of successive terms. And on the right-hand side, you're left with 2L times f, the initial f of x0 minus f of xn plus 1. And here you get the sum of the squares of the gradients. Now if you know right away this gives convergence, because if you know a priori that the function is bounded below, which you often do know, right, in cases that we're dealing with, we know that the function is always non-negative, for example. So if you know that, you know that the right-hand side is bounded, and that immediately means that the gradients of f with respect to xk are going to 0. So right away, this guarantees convergence. Okay, um, Okay. what else can you say? I guess uh, Francis had very similar arguments to this. By applying Taylor's theorem in a slightly different way, you can find that the distance, if you've got a unique solution, that the distance between xk plus 1 and that unique solution is given by the distance between xk and that solution squared minus this amount. So again, okay, we can use, um, gee, this is very similar to the argument on Francis's slide. Um, we can see, first of all, that you're always getting closer to the solution with every step because this, just, this is just 1 over 2L. So the distance is always shrinking to the solution set. That's good news. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce a delta k as being the non-optimality measure in the function f. So this is the distance between f of x k and its optimal value. So you can, by convexity, you know that uh, you know that this is less than or equal to that. Francis drew a picture that illustrated why that was true earlier on. Uh, that's less, less than or equal to that. This is the uh, Satoshi-Schwartz inequality. Okay, the, the size of an inner product is bounded by uh, the, the product of the two norms, of the two vectors in the inner product. And then that's bounded by that because I've just replaced xk by x0. And because uh, we're always getting closer to the solution, I can bound this by this. Okay, so using that, well, let's see, what's my reasoning here? Um, I'm able to say that, um, yeah, I'm able to go back to this page and subtract f of x star from both sides. Okay, so if I subtract f of x star from both sides, this becomes delta k plus 1, and this becomes delta k. All right, so I get that, that expression there. And now, how do I get from here to here? Um, I guess I used um, this guy. Okay, so I used, I used this guy to bound this. I found a lower bound on the gradient of f of x k. I said that's greater than or equal to delta k divided by... Um, x0 minus xk squared. So that's how I got from there to there. So now I've got a recurrence relation on the delta, on, del, on the sequence delta k. And I'm getting that the delta k is always getting smaller, and it's getting smaller by a certain amount. Now this allows me to get a rate, okay? This is telling me not only that delta k is going to zero, but by a certain trick, just an algebraic trick, I can show that it's going to zero at a rate of 1 over k. So here's the trick. You take the reciprocal of both sides. You take this expression and take 1 over both sides and then do a bit of bounding and mess around a little bit. And what you end up being able to show is that 1 over delta k plus 1 is greater than or equal to k plus 1 over a constant. And then if you flip them back again, that means that delta k is less than or equal to 
constant over k plus 1. So this is pretty cool, okay? You've been able to show that for a function where the, the eigenvalues of the Hessian are bounded above, that steepest descent with this very naive choice of step length actually converges at a rate, the function values converge to their optimum at a rate of 1 over k, all right? Not only do they converge, but they converge at at least that rate. So that's a pretty nice observation. Now I want to point out that this is, even though this is a nice observation, it's still really slow, okay? 1 over k is a really slow rate. So in other words, if you want 10 times the amount of accuracy, you have to do 10 times as many iterations, okay? That's pretty slow, all right? But still it's something. Now in the case of strong convexity, you can say much more about the, the convergence rate using the same sorts of naivety in the step length, all right? So let's go back to uh, the definition of strong convexity and let's look at what happens when I take the uh, approximation to f of z based on, on what's happening at, f of, uh, at xk. So I can get this bound for f of z, a lower bound on f of z, okay? So this analysis is different from the one I just presented. It's even simpler and it ends up giving me a stronger rate, okay? Now, this is the key expression. I've taken an arbitrary point z, and I've found a lower bound on f of z. Now I minimize both sides, okay? I can minimize the two sides independently, and the greater than or equal to will still be true. So I'm going to choose a z that minimizes that side, and that z is obviously going to be the optimum, x star, okay? And I'm going to choose a z that minimizes that side, and that's something different from x star. Okay, but when I plug that z in, I get this on the right-hand side. So I'm able to show that this is a lower bound on f of x star. So I can get a lower bound on f of x star in terms of the function and the gradient of, at xk. All right, that's pretty neat. And now by manipulating that, <coughs> I'm just taking this over the right-hand side, over the left-hand side, taking that over the right-hand side, and so on. I find that the gradient of f of xk is bounded below by 2 times mu. So I'm dealing here with the strongly convex case where mu is positive. So this gradient squared is bounded by 2 times mu times the non-optimality measure in the function. Okay? So I've already derived from the previous slides, I used this a lot in the last few slides, that f of xk plus 1 is bounded below by f of x, is bounded above by f of xk minus this. So what am I going to do with this? I'm going to subtract um, f of x star from both sides of this. Okay, lo and behold, uh, and then I'm going to replace this by this bound. Okay, so subtracting f of x star from both sides and using this bound, this is what I end up with. That the non-optimality at the new iterate, xk plus 1, is this factor times the non-optimality at the previous iterate. So we're able to show that you actually get a decrease in the, uh, the non-optimality measure by a constant factor that's strictly less than 1 at every iteration, okay? So that's what's called a linear or geometric rate of convergence. And that's, in, that's typically much stronger than that 1 over k rate that I had on the previous slide, okay? So if, you want, if you've got a thing like this and you want, you want to uh, find out how many iterations do you need to get a solution that's 10 times more accurate, when you've got an algorithm that converges like 1 over k, you need 10 times as many iterations. In this case, what do you need? You need to choose the number of ex extra iterations that will make 1 minus mu over L to the k be less than or equal to 1 over 10. Maybe I've got that on the next slide. Hold on. Uh, yeah, I'll probably do that calculation later, but let's do it because it's easy. Okay. All right, so I need um, to get a 10 times more accurate rate, I need this to be less than or equal to 1 over 10, okay? So this is how many extra iterations I need, k iterations. So how can I figure out what k is? Well, I can take the log of both sides times k needs to be less than or equal to minus log 10, okay? Now I can, use, um, I can use the fact that uh, log of 1 minus mu over L is approximately equal to minus mu over L. Okay, I won't get too fancy with whether it's an upper bound or a lower bound, but it's approximately that, okay? And so this expression becomes approximately equivalent to K times minus mu over L needs to be less than or equal to minus log 10, 
okay? And this tells you that k needs to be greater than or equal to L over mu times log 10. All right, so the number of extra iterates you need to get a 10 times more accurate solution basically is related to uh, the condition number, the ratio of L over mu. So if you've got a well-conditioned problem where L and mu are not very different, you can very quickly get more accurate solutions, okay? You don't really need to do much extra work to get much more accurate solutions, okay? But obviously, as mu goes to zero, this number gets very big and it degrades to that uh, 1 over k type result that we talked about earlier, okay? But the, the thing that I want you to take away from this is that if you've got a reasonable lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue of the Hessian, in general, um, you can get uh, geometric or, or uh, linear convergence rates. Now, sometimes in the literature, particularly in the machine learning literature, people call this an exponential convergence rate. Um, I prefer not to use that term because it makes it sound like it's really, really fast. And this is kind of pretty fast, but not, you know, if in the case where you've got an ill-conditioned problem, it's not very fast. You know, if this is 0.999, it's still kind of slowish, okay? But, uh, uh, but, you know, it's better than a sublinear rate, which is what 1 over k is. Okay, um, there's an important point to make here in that the linear convergence analysis that I showed you on the last couple of slides, it basically used two bounds. If you go back to what I did here, it used these two bounds, and generally they look like this. There's an upper bound on the norm of the gradient of uh, f at xk, and there's, a uh, and there's a, uh, an upper bound on f of xk plus 1. And we glom those two together to get a linear rate. So it turns out that for you don't necessarily need strong convexity to get these kinds of bounds. So it's been observed recently that in cases where you don't have a unique solution, but the function f increases quadratically as you move away from the solution set, that that's enough to get these bounds, and therefore that's enough to get a linear rate. And this is actually useful when you've got an entire manifold, linear subspace of solutions, which you often do, okay? So it, you often see in, in uh, machine learning and statistics, you often see problems where, um, where you've got the, the objective function is a function of A times X, where A is a matrix with more columns and than rows, okay? So if your objective, and, and f itself is a strongly convex function, okay? So because this is a composition of a strongly convex function and an affine function, it's still convex, but it's no longer strongly convex. If you take the Hessian of this function, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have A transpose times the Hessian of f times, um, let's see, yeah, A transpose times the Hessian of f times A. So it's going to be generically rank deficient. It's never going to be strongly convex, okay? However, if F is strongly convex, there's an entire manifold of solutions. And um, it's the set of points where AX achieves some constant value, okay? And it will still satisfy, even though it fails to satisfy strong convexity, it still satisfies conditions like that because it satisfies a quadratic growth condition. And so you can get linear convergence for problems like that as well. So generalized linear models that crop up a lot in statistics often have this form. And so you can get uh, linear convergence rates for them, just like you get for strongly convex functions. Also, it's been observed recently that uh, the second one is a special case of what's called the kodaika lovashevich property. That's a property that, that has this uh, form where you can show that the gradient well, the growth of f as you move away from the optimal set, it grows at least as fast as some power of the gradient, okay? What that's telling you is that the gradient is telling you something about how suboptimal you are, okay? You don't get a situation when you're a long way from optimality, but the gradient is still small. So th that's kind of intuitively important because it means that a first order method, which is basically making all its decisions based on the size of the gradient, isn't going to be fooled. You know, if the gradient is telling you something about how far you are from being optimal, first order method is having a chance of working. And that's basically what this condition holds. It, but it's a weakened condition and strong convexity. And then this is the one I just talked about here, where F has the form uh, of a linear, uh, a composition of an affine operator and a strongly convex operator. Okay. 
they're fairly recent observations that these things, uh, things, nice things happen in these more general cases. Okay, so you might ask the question that, you know, I've done all this analysis for a naive choice of alpha k. Um, can I do better if I choose alpha k exactly? That is, every time I do a search, I pick the alpha k that actually minimizes f along the search direction. Well, we can do an analysis for just the case where f is quadratic that shows that, no, we can't necessarily do better by doing the exact line search. And I've done the analysis here. I don't think I want to go through it in too much detail. You can show, though, that, uh, that each step length you choose will be in the range of the extreme eigenvalues, be somewhere between the inverses of the two extreme eigenvalues. And that if you use that minimizing alpha k, you can actually get an exact expression for how much the function decreases at each step. It will decrease at a linear rate. You can show that you get a linear improvement. But it's not much better than what you get by just taking the, the standard 1 over L step. Okay? So in the case where we took the naive step, what we got was 1 minus 1 over kappa. By taking the exact step, we get 1 minus 2 over kappa squared, which is four, factor of 4 better, basically. Okay? About factor of 4 better. But it's not radically better. Okay? So we don't get a massive quantum improvement by doing an exact line search in general. So it's sort of a negative result. Okay, so the slow linear rate, when you're talking about applying a gradient descent to ill-conditioned functions, the slow linear rate is kind of typical. It's not pessimistic. You really do see slow convergence at that rate. It's not just a, a bad upper bound. So this is the classic picture of what you get when you've got an ill-conditioned function in two dimensions. Ill-conditioning is... is uh, implied by these elongated sort of oper uh, elongated ellipses being the contours. When you start from a point here, you tend to zigzag back and forth across the valley, only making slow progress towards the solution. Okay, so there's this idea that I mentioned at the start where, and it's not a totally intuitive idea, of using momentum. And the first, maybe the first method in this class is called the heavy ball. And the idea here is that each step is not simply a step in the negative gradient direction, but you also keep going in the direction of the step that you just took at the previous iteration. Okay? So the step from xk to xk plus 1 is a composite of a, of a negative gradient step and a continuation of the previous step. All right? So we can analyze this, and this analysis goes back to a 1985 book by Polyak. We can come up with an analysis of this by by looking at what happens over two consecutive steps. So I, I can define this vector wk to be the error vector taken at two successive iterates. And I can look at what happens when k goes to k plus 1. And what we can show is that uh, this is the change, you know, to first order, this is what happens to wk. It gets multiplied by this vector, um, by this matrix beta. Okay? So you can see that the second component of wk plus 1 is just going to be xk minus x star, and that's the same as the first component of wk. So that's why I've got identity 0 here. And you can show by doing a, uh, a sort of a Taylor series expansion on the gradient that xk plus 1 minus, sorry, xk plus 1 minus x star is approximately minus alpha times the optimal Hessian times xk plus, times xk minus x star. So how do I get this term? I get this term by adding, by subtracting from here grad f of x star. Now grad f of x star is 0, right? So I'm free to subtract it from here. Now grad f of xk minus grad f of x star is approximately, I keep losing the chalk. Sorry. Here it is. Okay. So grad f of xk minus grad f of x star is approximately Hessian of f of x star transpose x k minus, or times x k minus x star. So that's how I get that term here. Okay, and then that you can figure out where that comes from. So very simple idea. Uh, heavy ball, because it's like a heavy ball, it tends to keep rolling in the same direction, but we tweak it a little bit in the direction of the latest, the latest gradient. So, okay, the trick is how do you choose these parameters alpha and beta? 
What's the optimal way you can choose them to get good overall convergence? Okay, so suppose that um, we do an eigenvalue decomposition of the optimal Hessian, Hessian of f at x star. So write the eigenvalues of this like in this form. Then we can do an eigenvalue decomposition of the matrix B and we can figure out how can we choose alpha and beta to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of B. Okay, that will give me sort of the maximum contraction here. Assuming I get close enough that I can ignore this lower order term. So that's the game, to pick alpha and beta to minimize the maximum eigenvalue of B. And it turns out this is the optimal choice. It's defined in terms of the extreme eigenvalues of the optimal Hessian. L is the maximum eigenvalue, kappa is L over mu, where mu is the smallest <coughs> eigenvalue. So making these choices, um, we actually get a faster convergence rate. Now let me tell you what these choices are. If, kappa, if the problem is ill-conditioned, kappa is large. So beta will be close to 1, and alpha will be closer to uh, 1 over L, or 4 over L. Okay? So for ill-conditioned problems, beta, we tend to mostly keep rolling in the same direction. But we put a little tweak in the direction of the latest gradient. So we get a better rate. Okay? Instead of 1 minus 1 over kappa, which is what we get for steepest descent, we get 1 minus 2 over square root of kappa. Okay? And that's significantly better. So if I'm looking at how, much, um, how many iterates do I need to improve the error by a factor of epsilon, um, in the case of steepest descent, I need, so, I, need something, I need a number of iterates proportional to kappa times log epsilon. Okay, that's what I got in that analysis over there. Okay? But if I'm doing heavy ball, I only need square root of kappa log epsilon. So if you're dealing with, an, say, a fairly ill-conditioned problem where kappa is 1,000, you need 30 times fewer steps. So getting a faster linear rate is really helping out here. So momentum really helps, okay? But you might say, well, heavy ball, this is a kind of an old, traditional, clunky method. You know, surely this is an idea that's come and gone. Well, in fact, this idea of using the previous step is actually ubiquitous. It's been around in various guises for a long time. Conjugate gradient is probably the workhorse algorithm in scientific computing in the case where f is a quadratic function. This is absolutely ubiquitous in scientific computing. And it's basically a heavy ball type method. It's sort of an adaptive heavy ball method where you're adaptively choosing the alpha and the beta at every step. So if you look at the basic step in a classical conjugate gradient method, it looks like this. It takes a step in the direction pk, but how is pk defined? pk is a combination of the latest negative gradient and the previous search direction, okay? So it's exactly a kind of a momentum heavy ball method with an adaptive choice of parameters. That's all it is. And in nonlinear conjugate gradient, there are various schemes for choosing the gamma k and various convergence results that are provable for that. So conjugate gradient is really a variant on the same idea. And you can prove the same sorts of asymptotic convergence rates for conjugate gradient. The analysis for conjugate gradient is very rich theory for conjugate gradient particularly for the quadratic case. There's a whole chapter in, in our book about that. Now, this is something that, that Francis started to talk about in his last, last slide, and I hope he continues to talk about it in his next lecture, this idea of accelerated first-order methods. And it traces probably to Nesterov in, in 1983. And it really can be viewed as a variant of the same idea, okay? Of the same idea as using the previous step, sort of continuing partly in the direction of the previous step and partly in the direction of the latest gradient information. The difference between this and, and heavy ball or conjugate gradient is it sort of teases apart the two, the two steps. It doesn't combine the, the uh, previous step and the latest gradient into a single step. It takes a step in the direction of the gradient and then takes a step in the direction of the previous step. Okay? So... You can, see that's what's, you can see what's happening here. It all looks very complicated because there's kind of an adaptive choice of the parameters. But this is where it starts out taking just a classical negative gradient step. That's how it gets from yk to xk plus 1. And then it modifies xk plus 1 by taking a step in the direction uh, you know, that the previous xk came from. So it keeps moving in the difference, of the difference in the last two xk's. So it's kind of teased apart the two components of the step. And it's used at, 
adaptive choice in pra of parameter beta k in doing so. Okay, so really it's using the same idea of momentum uh, as, we, as we've seen in these other uh, methods. Now, Francis says that he has, uh, he, there are many variants of this accelerated first order method, okay? This is the basic one due to Nesterov. Uh, many others have been proposed since then, including many by Nesterov himself. Um, and the theme is that you still get these one over square root of kappa kinds of convergence rates. You get the same kinds of acceleration that you see for heavy ball and these other methods. The bonus with, um, with Nesterov's method is that even when you're not dealing with a strongly convex function, you get an improvement in the sublinear rate as well. Remember for the sublinear, for the uh, case of not strongly convex, we got a 1 over k rate. Well, here we get a um, 1 over k squared rate for this accelerated method. So we get an improvement even in the case where we don't have uh, strong convexity. Okay. So pretty nice, pretty nice results. Now, this, this method or variant on this method came up in the case of compressed sensing in the form of this very popular FISTA method due to Beck and Taboul. And it's a method of the same kind of, uh, it's a sort of Nesterov acceleration method. You can see it looks very much the same here. There's the same sort of step in the direction of the negative gradient. There's some messing around with the cho choice of parameters. And then there's a step uh, in the direction of the previous iteration. Okay. And they get the same sorts of convergence rates. And they also have schemes for the, dealing with the case where you don't a priori have an upper bound in the eigenvalues. There are the ways in all these methods of adaptively estimating an appropriate choice of L okay, by monitoring the convergence rate and continuing to increase L until you seem to have it right. So the analysis in Beck and Debull, the thing about all these analyses is that they're sort of non-intuitive. They write out these very complicated expressions and then spot that if you make various choices of parameters, you get nice cancellations happening. Beck and Debull do it pretty neatly in two or three pages, and none of the steps are complicated, but none of them, you know, one, they don't naturally lead one into another. In other words, it's quite technical. And I think that Francis and his collaborators recently have figured out how to compress it down into something that's somewhat intuitive and also uh, straightforward, which is, I think, a big contribution. So this is all very important. These the workhorse algorithms in, in uh, machine learning and compressed sensing tend to use these concepts of acceleration. OK, I'll say a little bit about this crazy approach due to a uh, crazy colleague of ours, John Borwine, and his postdoc back in the 1980s called Basil O. Borwine. Now, this is not a descent method, okay? So that's why I call it a non-monotone gradient method. It's turned out to be useful in some situations. And it's very non-intuitive, okay? It makes choices of the step length, which sometimes lead to very large increases in the function value, okay? And I can draw a picture even of what's going on. This is what you get with classical short step steepest descent. In Basel A. Borwein, you tend to get steps like this. You start here, and you zoom off to a point somewhere up here where the function value is much higher. Okay? Now, why might that be interesting? Well, the reason it might be interesting is it could be that the gradient at this point up here will lead you back to a point where over a space of two iterations, you make significant progress towards a solution. So if you look at what's happening over a span of every second iteration, you actually are making pretty good progress, more than you're what you're making here. So that's the magic of these methods, that if you view them kind of more widely, uh, they make good progress. And in fact, they've got analysis that backs that up. So how do they work? Well, just very briefly, because I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, they sort of mimic a Newton's method in some sense. Okay, so how does Newton's method work when you're minimizing F? Since I won't get to talk about it, although I think Francis will talk a little bit more about it. Newton's method for minimizing f um, has its, this takes the steps like this. It takes xk minus the Hessian of f at xk inverse times the gradient of f of xk. All right, that's the classical Newton's method. Its big advantage is that it converges quadratically. It's big, very rapidly in other words. Um, its big disadvantage is that you need to be able to work with a Hessian or estimates of the Hessian. And in many cases, that's hard. Okay, so what do they do in Basel A. Boyne? Well, they make the observation that you may not know the Hessian, 
But what you do know is that if you look at the difference between two successive gradients, if you use Taylor's theorem, that's approximately equal to the Hessian times the difference between the last two successive x vectors. Okay? So Taylor's theorem says the difference of the gradients is approximately the Hessian times the difference of the x's. So quasi-Newton methods, which unfortunately I'm not going to talk much about, but they're another very important class of methods, they use this, they use exactly this expression to build up information about the Hessian by looking at the difference of successive gradients. So quasi-Newton methods keep track of the difference of each successive pair of gradients, and they, they know that that's giving them information about the action of the Hessian in a particular one-dimensional space. So by looking at what happens over a sequence of iterations, you gradually build up knowledge of the Hessian. So Basel-Iborian methods do the same thing, except that they make a lower, a very uh, one-parameter approximation to the Hessian. They pretend that you can parameterize this Hessian by 1 over alpha times an identity. Okay, So they find the alpha that gives you the best one-parameter approximation to this Hessian. And they do that by... By taking this, um, by taking the difference of the gradients, taking the difference of the x's, and solving this least squares problem to find the alpha, which, which minimizes the discrepancy between the two sides of the expression I showed you earlier. Okay, and because this is such a simple one-parameter problem, you can solve it explicitly, and you can figure out, and that that's the step length they use. So this in, this mimic this mimics Newton's method, where I've replaced the Hessian inverse with alpha k. That's it. Okay? Alpha k times the identity. So it's a mimic it's mimics Newton's method where you replace the Hessian by this very elementary one parameter approximation. Okay. And they've got an analysis of this. There are many variants of this, so I won't I won't go into it. They've got an analysis, they've got a short paper in nineteen eighty eight, a brilliant non conventional analysis that kind of shows that unless you're very unlucky uh, over a sequence of iterations, you're going to get significant improvements in the function value. I encourage you to read this paper. It's very ingenious. Borwein is also an expert in special functions, and it sort of uses special function type analysis, which, as far as I know, hasn't been used before or since in analyzing optimization methods. But he's a very original guy. All right, when you want to extend all... I promised you at the start, when you're dealing with first-order methods, most of them you can extend to, to more general situations, such as where you've got constraints. So the Nesterov method, you can extend it to the case where you want to minimize f over some constraint set omega by just changing one part of the method, one line in the method. And that is instead of defining, um, instead of defining xk plus 1 to be yk minus 1 over l times the gradient, you solve this little quadratic subproblem where you minimize this over y belonging to omega. So that's the only change you need to make to turn an algorithm for minimizing f into an algorithm for minimizing f subject to x belonging to omega. Okay? Do we want to finish soon? Yeah. Sure. Two minutes? Is that okay? Okay. Got it. All right. I thought I had till top of the hour. But anyway, it's fine. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Uh, you can you can generalize it for regularized optimization where we add on um, we add on this uh, Tikhonov type regularization term. Again, you can just change the update step to bring in that second term explicitly. I'll say more about that in the last um, in the last session. Um, I think I'll yeah I think I can stop here and then uh, I'll stop here and then I'll continue in the last session. Okay. Great.